Welcome to the Retail Tech Podcast, where we talk about the full spectrum of technologies and implementation used in omnichannel and online retail. Make sure to subscribe to our newsletter at retailtechpodcast.com, and we always look forward to your feedback. Today, I'm speaking with Patrick Pollan, CEO and founder of a company called API Fortress, talking about APIs and all the interesting and important things that are related to them. Hi, Patrick. How are you? I'm great. Thanks so much. Fantastic. Thank you for taking the time to talk to me. Um, can you uh, start from like really basic and tell uh, the audience what APIs are? Sure. So APIs are the pipes, basically, that connect different systems. So let's say you're using your cell phone. The way that Instagram communicates with the Instagram servers is using an API. It's a, it's a That's the connection. That's what those are called. API is just sort of a general term for the ways that different platforms can communicate amongst each other. Okay. So that's like, a, I think it stands for like application interface. Application programming program interface. Interf- interface. Right. Yeah. And um, it's actually a piece of software, right? It's, it's a uh, code that's written in different languages, correct? Yeah, I mean, it could be written in any language, but ultimately it comes down to uh, making sure that there is a, a way in which you can tunnel information in a way that works for both sides of that communication. Okay, and typically what's, what's inside that API document? Is it, uh, for example, a list of correct attributes? Sure, sure. So typical API, um, what, when you make a call to an API, it's typically called a payload or a response. And that typical payload response, if we're really specific to like the e-commerce world, there you could do a, an API call that is actually a search query for, let's say, red. And it'll return every single object with the word red in it somewhere. And uh, it'll return like the product ID, some product information, pricing, and a link to the image. And it's really just a, a bunch of text it's a really long file of text that gets returned, and that's called the API response or payload. That's like one common example of it. Okay. And what's the difference between an API and an endpoint? Uh, so an API is, so all these terms sort of get shifted around these days. API is a very vague term because of the ways so many different people have used it. But an API these days is sort of applied to the general program and an endpoint is one specific thing. So you can have an API, which is an, you can have a search endpoint. Then you could have like a checkout endpoint and a shopping cart endpoint. And all of those endpoints together make up your API program. Okay. All right. So when, when you have, but, you know, within the API program, you're going to have the breakdowns of the search and different things. As Correct. Well. You can have, yep. Yeah, sometimes there's just five endpoints. Sometimes there's a hundred. It really depends on the company and what they're looking to achieve with the, with their API program. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. I mean, I, I just wanted to give a, like a really high level, uh, description, um, because, you know, for people that are not actually developers, it, these are all like, you know, C, black boxes, really, you know, the tech. Yeah. The tech team says, oh, I'm working on the API. Okay, whatever that means. <laughs> when is it going to be done? <laughs> yeah, that's why one of the first things I do when I, when I show the product to anyone is I show them what an API is. You can make a simple API call in your browser. It's just a, it's a regular HTTP request. It's like going to a website. And you can make a call that way to like a norm, to like, let's just say, let's just really break it down and just say REST APIs. And you just load it up in the browser and you see it's just all this text that says like product ID, price, image, shipping options. It's, it's, fair, it's very simple to see. And we make a lot of examples of it on our, on our blog on Medium as well just to make sure that we communicate correctly. Like this isn't something that you can't understand. You should know what it is. But we will let you know that no one's testing it. And, it's, and it is fairly complex to test. But there are applications and platforms today that can do it for you. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, really again, going back to one of my pet peeves is the the fact that uh, a lot of executives in the companies, they don't really know about technology that much and they shouldn't really know about technology that much necessary to run, for example, a retail business. But an API is becoming such an integral and important part of this business that they should at least have like a really an overview understanding of what it is they don't need to know the code but they really should have an eye on it 
they need to know what's going on with the, with the their own APIs or any APIs that are they're using from third parties. And yeah, and that's why we're we were so excited to jump into the market. We really started this in 2013 because the CEO can see that the website is down. The CEO can see that the website's like the homepage image is broken. They can see that, and so there were tools or the tools called Selenium, open source that allows you to automate the testing of like the website, the front end. But the CEO does not see the APIs that may be causing that issue, and they don't see the uh, referring to a the case study that we wrote recently of these subtle errors that you don't see on the website at all, but maybe, maybe costing you thousands of dollars. And this is all because it's just not visually there. Like you don't know that there's a problem unless you're testing for it. And so that's why we jumped into this market because we, there is no selenium for APIs. And so that's what our goal was to build. And that's what I think we have built. So why, so you're, your you know API Fortress is in the API monitoring business. Uh, what is API monitoring and why is it important? Sure. So what's interesting is we're actually sort of two things, but similar to what happened with APIs, there's uh, the terminology has shifted, and we do API monitoring and testing, and so there, it really stands for two things. So monitoring is performance and uptime, and those are two very important things. But they're not as important as they used to be, and they're not the end-all, be-all, because you're using tool platforms on Amazon to test your websites on Amazon. Like It's not the greatest performance test in the world, because it looks amazing, but it's not that reliable. If Amazon goes down, you're both on Amazon, you're both dealing with an issue. Uh, what we do on top of performance, and that's the real unique perspective that we have, is that we also do testing that so the actual payload response the api is like response the payload that big old wall of text we can actually analyze each line of that and confirm that it's accurate and it and it runs within the business logic and the expectations of where what should occur because we see things like uh 3, products not having a category id that means those products aren't shown on a homepage, and that's like $70,000 if it's average 20 price per product that is just being potentially lost in sales every day because of something as small as, hey, these 3,000 items are missing a category ID. That's the sort of stuff that is really unique and important, and that's where we call it testing while everyone's talking about monitoring because right now the tools available are mostly just doing monitoring. We're the first ones that are really focused in entirely on on the accuracy of these payloads and uh, making sure that there's no flaws within the responses. Okay, so when when you say testing, you're not necessarily talking about performance testing. No, no. Okay. So we do monitoring and testing. So the monitoring aspect is where you can really you call the, the performance metrics and uptimes. When we say testing, that's when we really mean like actually testing the response, similar to how you would test a web page by looking at it. You know, you could do a ping test for a web page to make sure it's up, and that's monitoring of the web page. But when you're testing the web page, you want to make sure that there's no typos and every image is not broken. Okay, and how do you actually... Um how are you well let's let's get into the um, the the take case studies that you just uh, you know you you uh, recently published um looking at the um, uh, your article uh, about uh, like four different uh points you want to go through these for us Sure, sure. I mean I'll, I'll just go through some of the high level ideas. So um, as I was saying before, you know, sometimes there are like product listing endpoints, endpoints that have all of your products. If you test those, you can really analyze every product and all the information associated with it. And if there's missing something like category, well, your homepage navigation uses the category associated with the products to put it in there. And if it's missing the category information, then you really end up getting getting all these products that are missing from your from your end users. It's, it's one of these major things that not enough people are, are realizing, and that's like direct lost sales but then there leads to a lot of other issues that are more that are more subtle and you you have that are actually difficult to catch one example we have and these are all like examples from our from our customers that we've sort of anonymized but one example is our one of our customers was a store similar to like think of what Sears where they could sell anything from like socks to washers and dryers and they actually had if you use the app every single product had mounting instructions. So you would try to buy like a birthday cake and it would have instruction on how to mount the birthday cake. And so obviously that was a flaw, but it's one of those things that you don't really, 
it's not super easy to catch unless you have this very intelligent way of testing these things or unless you're testing it manually, which is done less and less today with all the automation tools. So this was going on for weeks before one of the QAs finally was doing some manual testing and realized this is actually happening everywhere. And so it's, it's one of those things where it's, it's subtle, it's not catastrophic. So the CEO probably didn't even realize that there was an issue, but how many sales did they lose because their customers are seeing, they're trying to buy jeans and the jeans has a bunch of information on how to mount it. They clearly are thinking like, well, there's this website might not be working. Maybe I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't like actually complete this transaction because I'm not sure it's a hello in, in our case study. Okay. Your, go your voice got cut off there. Uh, oh, sorry. We could okay. do it again. Yeah, just the last sentence. The, the, the CEO was not aware of. Oh, okay, yeah. So the CEO is not aware of very subtle things like the mounting instructions being on every single cake. It's it on birthday cakes because it's just the CEO is not checking the app. It isn't until the QA checks it themselves that they find this and they report it and then they launch a whole investigation and realize that this is a problem and there are probably hundreds if not thousands of customers that decided not to complete the transaction because they thought the website was broken and they just didn't trust it all because of this small API issue that was just un untested for. So, so the, the API that we're talking about is actually coming from a third party that's providing, for example, let's say it's their 3PL or their, um, their catalog provider, their drop shipper, right? It could be, or it could be their own APIs. A lot of, uh, not every retailer, but a lot of retailers today are offering APIs to, uh, to to third parties that allow them to go through, like Best Buy, for example, has a public API program that allows people to list items within Best Buy's product catalog on your website. So they have an API that shows all the products they own, and they also allow some people to use their checkout APIs. But it's it's really for them just giving everyone access to all the products that can be sold at Best Buy. Amazon has similar things. Uh, uh, I was actually just looking at a, another one the other day. They, that there's just a lot of people that have, that have APIs available, like Etsy. Etsy's another one where they want you to know everything available so that if you want to build apps for it or if you want to be an affiliate sales, you can do that thanks to their API. It's giving them another avenue for revenue. Right. Okay. So that's the, uh, the any, any other examples? Um, well, um, as you were saying, like the uh, three PLs, those are also very, those are used as well. One interesting thing is you have uh, companies such as Search Spring, which is a third party API that e-commerce companies use to improve their search. So it's sort of like it auto completes your searches in a very intelligent way. That's a third party API. So like you want to make sure that works for you. So not only do you want to test and monitor your own APIs, you should be keeping an eye on the search springs of the world because your, your own search depends on that, on that API. Right. So, so I think that's a good distinction to make. It's uh, between, <laughs> your internal APIs. So there is really, you know, even within your own applications, let's say between your backend and your, your iOS app, you have, you know, what are effectively APIs. You have endpoints that actually, you know, are, are making the communication happen. The development team typically is paying a lot more attention to the endpoints within your own software. So, so is that something that you also look at or is it mostly like external? Uh, we do both. So what's interesting is that we, specific to e-commerce, people are always saying, well, we don't really use any APIs because they're just not aware of how many APIs are actually used on a day-to-day -day basis. The reality is if you have a kiosk or if you have an application of any sort, you for sure have APIs. Now, if you just have a, a store set up using like a demandware, you may or may not have like these, these public and open API programs. But I would say 70% of e-commerce and 100% of large e-commerce companies all have APIs that they either provide or their platform needs to use, or it's a third party like the search springs of the world that, that they're using today. Okay. So if I'm if I am a, an e-commerce website, you know, owner of a you know e-commerce company, 
um, th there is a possibility that the web page that I'm displaying to my customers has multiple APIs feeding that content. How, yeah. how do I keep on top of the performance, the overall performance, and then also finding out what are potential, like, you know, single APIs that may be causing problems? Sure. So there's two methods that we are, we're focused on. So there's the SaaS model, the cloud model, and then the on-premises model. The SaaS model is more along the lines of like you, you, we have servers on the East Coast, the West Coast, and let's say Brazil, and they would call your API like every two minutes, every five minutes, and keep track of the response times and the performance of all of those calls. And that gives you ideas. So you get notified the minute one of them is outside of the expected expected range. It keeps a lot of historical information so that you can get an idea of like, hey, every Friday at 6 a.m., apparently there's a server refresh that we're not realizing, and it's causing significant issues for all of our all of our sales for all of our sales in the East Coast and in Brazil, but the West Coast seems fine. And then there's the on-premises model, whereby you can actually test live traffic, especially if you're using like a large. Uh, API manager. So every single call going through can be tested against without affecting your performance. So that instead of just emulating it like you would do with the cloud with cloud testing, you can actually capture every call going through and see like how is this performing? How long how long is it taking to get to the customer and is the payload itself Hello? Yeah, uh, did, it, did it break off? Yeah, it break, broke off again uh, from the point where you were saying is the payload itself? Uh, is the payload itself? Um, I, th I think it was like, uh, you know, when on the on-premises. Oh, okay. Yeah, I could just do on-premises. Okay. I'll just do that again. Yeah. All right. Then our... Um, then we also have the on-premises model, whereby you can test actual live traffic going through, especially if you have an API manager. It makes it really easy. And what's useful about that is you're not testing. You're not creating false, false tests just to see how it is. You're actually using, you're using actual API calls that the customers are making and testing against those. And that can give you all the insight you need to see exactly what your customers are buying and whether those responses back and forth have any flaws or inaccuracies amongst them by just making sure you're testing and monitoring each one, each and every one. Okay, so so you're basically in that case you're testing and you're testing and monitoring the client's really internal cloud. Correct. We right. can yeah, that's the on-premises model. It's all right. that traffic going through. Let's keep an eye on it. Right. So going back to the SaaS model, let's say if I have uh, 10 different APIs feeding my web page, were you saying that you actually test my incoming APIs as well and tell me, for example, of these 10 APIs, this is how they're performing? Yeah, so what we can do or what you can do if you just log in and create your own account is you can actually create these full integration tests, we call them. That's tests that can make multiple calls all within one. So if your web page is making like five unique calls all within like getting one thing, you can make all five calls within this one test. A lot of platforms just exercise one endpoint at a time, but our platform allows you to exercise as many as you need because we want to properly emulate what one of your customers and what one of your users would experience. And, the, and every single call gets called within one test and then it, every, all of that data that gets returned is analyzed not just the speed that it came in but actually the response itself is gone through line by line and analyzed fully and and that's done you do that uh, programmatically or manually it's it's done automatically so our platform allows you to create tests automatically and then once that test is built, it doesn't need to be updated very much. Once you build a test using our platform, which takes about a minute, from then on, it just runs over and over again or tests against the, the on-premises calls over and over again to make sure that everything is in line. Because that's the one benefit of, of APIs. While websites get updated all the time, APIs, their general structure has to remain the same because that's what developers are building off of. If you're constantly changing what an API looks like, everyone that uses that API has to completely rebuild the website. So it has to remain fairly static. 
APIs update constantly and they're constantly being improved and tweaked, but the end result, the actual payload response, its structure usually has to remain fairly consistent, which means that a test can be good for two, three months before it needs to be updated. Okay. Um, so wh what about the difference between apps and websites? Is there a difference? Because, I mean, a lot of apps are directly calling APIs as opposed to websites or the backend servers. Is there a difference? Sometimes there is, sometimes there, there isn't. Like, there are companies that expose APIs for their apps, but their platform itself just works off of like a, you know, one of those, like the demand wares of the world. So there's just works. There are other platforms that APIs are powering the entire thing. So if you do a search on the app, it's the exact same search that you get on the website. They've used the API for both. Okay. Um, so if, if I'm, uh, so going back to, I think the, um, probably some of the other cases that you had mentioned, um, um, you know, like this, the, the one that says this app is terrible. Um, it's a, um, oh, this is, the, yeah, that's actually the mounting uh, example that you had given me. So, um, so in, in that case, actually, how would your, um, how would API Fortress detect that? Uh, sure, sure. That specific problem. Yeah, so that's actually a good question. So what's specific with uh, our platform versus what some others can do is without write, having to write any code, again, I should reinforce that so anyone could use it, is it, it's, it's, uh, it's the if statement. It's the ability to adapt the rules based on the response. So if you make a call for, you do a search for red, comes back, you can look at, you could say, let's say it looks at the category, it says, all right, if the category is a painting, then there should be mounting instructions. If the category is automotive, there should be no mounting instructions. It's able to adapt its expectations based on what was returned. And those are, these are these really intelligent tests. Today, not many people are testing, and the few people that are testing are just doing these very basic tests that don't have that intelligence and that flexibility within it because they probably just built it by hand and wanted to get it done as quick as possible. And that's the advantage of using a platform. It's that it's easier to build these tests now and they can be more intelligent and, and, and be more flexible on the fly. Right. So, so, but you still have to give it the initial rules, right? Somebody has to yeah. provide the initial rules. Yeah, so in our platform, it actually builds a test automatically from, you know, if you're using any sort of definition file or if you're using apiary or if you just give it a payload it can analyze the payload and then it can give you a draft of the test. And from there you make adjustments so we can give you 90% of it. And then you just add on that last 10%, which is the, you know, the business logic to it. And in our platform, it's all drag and drop. And so the whole thing is done in under 10 minutes. And as I was saying before, you do it, you spend 10 minutes on it and it's good to go for months. Right. Yeah. So, so this has to be done. Um, I guess the 10 minutes, is it for per API or per when endpoint? Uh, it's typically per endpoint, and it could be 10 minutes, it could be one minute, it could be a half hour, but we haven't seen that in a while. Like oftentimes the, the test itself, it would be it's built automatically and it's pretty much good out of the box. We just like to tell everyone it's about 10 minutes per endpoint just to be conservative. But that's a very small amount of work when you're thinking about potentially saving $30,000 a day on a bunch of products that don't have an ID or on loss conversions because of a mounting issue or because of uh, your API manager is caching your listing ID and that's leading to whenever you make updates to your database, two, 300 items that are no longer valid are still showing up in the search in the search results, all because of just a small caching issue and not purging the cache after a refresh. Right. Well, I mean, just the, just the idea of having that done automatically is a major time saver. I know from you know from my own experience, it's uh, you know testing and actually doing something as a result of the test is this is like a, a you know not an easy uh, thing. So. Yeah, I mean, it all comes back to what we originally saw. We, there was 
Selenium is for websites, Appnium is for apps. And in 2013, we just couldn't figure out why this didn't exist. Like we sort of understood that it seemed complicated since websites are visual and apps are visual. So how do you apply a a program that can be used visually without any code to an API while APIs are mostly just text. Like they, they look kind of look like code. The reality is that we found the way to make that work. We have like 60 assertions. Uh, those are rules that pretty much capture all the sort of things that can hap happen within an API. Cause every API's endpoint responds differently. But when you really look at it, if it's just a basic rest JSON endpoint, it's going to be a product ID. All right, well that 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 has to be a number. Oh, this is a this item is a is it available for shipping? Yes or no? It's actually true or false. That's just a boolean. It's a simple. If you really break it down, there's only about 60 rules that are needed to capture all the variances. It's just about being able to adapt quickly to each one based on those 60 rules for each item. Right. Yeah, it's. Um, I, I think it definitely goes a long way to to have this kind of a service. So, um, going back and actually, one question that I had is I've heard the, I mean, the idea of REST APIs are, may also be evolving. What's what do you what do you see as the future and evolution of a, you know REST itself? Well, that's the that's the positive and the negative to technology. The negative is that people could come up with different things all the time. Just look at the proliferation of programming languages. How many programming languages are there? And there's no one winner. Everyone has everyone knows two, three programming languages, and then they have to adapt. And if they work at a company that doesn't use Java, then they have to learn a new one. So with technology, with the APIs, there's a lot of different ways that they work, but Fortunately, with uh, with some things, it does start start to get a little more standardized. So when we're talking about APIs, you know, there's SOAP and there's REST. Well, REST has really taken a, a foothold as the what everyone wants to use. And in terms of the structure of the response, there's JSON, there's XML, and then there's some other options. And there's also like you could just make up your own structure. But now people are realizing the benefit of everyone using one type, and JSON seems to be the one that's one that's winning that. So APIs are getting to that point now, even though they've existed for a while, we're only now getting to the point where they've started to standardize, which is only going to make it easier and easier to build tools like ours and to properly deploy them and have them have the intelligence necessary when we only have to deal with one type of API call and one type of uh, data structure. Right. Yeah, I mean, definitely having the standard makes it a lot easier on, on the business as well. It makes it cheaper to, to manage these things. So, but I mean, so this is really an evolution of EDI, right? The, the data interchange that used to run everything and it was like batch jobs and the, the, the key advantage of having the APIs is that it's a lot easier to do and it's also real time for the most part, right? Yeah, and you have to think like a lot of large companies are made of many different teams. And if you, when you start really focusing in on create, making sure that all of your processes and your platforms are available using an API, which uh, an API program, which really comes down to you know maybe make it REST, make it JSON, and then have some proper documentation around it to show how to communicate with it. Then you have like then you allow. The, like Blue Cross Blue Shield Global to be able to communicate with Blue Cross Blue Shield North Carolina all by using a, a fairly simple API program that they understand. Because once you've had to like authenticate with one OAuth, like you figured out how it works and it makes it easier and easier when you're just doing variations of the same thing because it's moderately standardized amongst the, amongst the company and amongst the industries. Right. So let's talk a little bit about, I guess, your own background and how API Fortress came about uh, to, you know, help, you know, provide these services. How, how did you, why did you think about, what was the, the, the story that basically brought you into this? Um, well, in 2013, I was uh, I spent a couple of years at a couple of companies, and I was actually working at Getty Images as their API evangelist for North America, and we were... As the evangelist of the API, I realized that I had very little insight as to what was going on with the API. Like I would be told well after the fact when there were issues, even though I'd get customer emails saying I think there was a problem, I wouldn't know that. I would be the last one to know, which is not a not a great 
not a great way to run your business. And so I started looking around for tools that can help me. And all the tools that exist were basically just IDEs. Like they allowed programmers to more easily create API tests. But I myself, you know, I my background was in technical project management, but I'm not a, I don't develop anymore. So I, I, I was just like, there's got to be a selenium for APIs. And one thing led to another. Uh, uh, my co-founder, he as well, noticed the need and we looked around in the market, we searched at the tools and we realized that there's, we thought there was a need for this. And so that's what we've been working on ever since. So uh, what stage is the company at right now? How many customers do you have? Do you, what kind of customers do you focus on? Uh, the customer numbers we usually like to keep quiet just for the investors, but the, uh, but the amount of cu the customers we work with differ every day. And that's one thing that's been really exciting about, about this market, because as I was saying, we're only starting to get to the world of more standardization. The, uh, a, two years ago, when I was doing searches on LinkedIn for API QAs, there would be like 100 responses, and now there's actually a few thousand. Very few companies have a proper QA team dedicated just to their APIs. They'll have a QA team, but they're just testing the website. And so then who's in charge of testing the, testing the APIs? And so today what's interesting is we're dealing with everyone from QAs to DevOps to site reliability engineers and very often to the developers themselves because they would love a tool that saves them money and time from having to, do, having to write even more code just to test this. Right. So they can, you know, a developer or a company can actually pick only specific um, APIs or endpoints that they want to have running on your software, right? Or being tested. Exactly. So we have some customers that only want to test their public APIs while their internal ones they want to keep internalized for a little while. There might be some security concerns, but the reality is that's why we have the on-premises model whereby you can just install the entire platform internally so that nothing escapes so that it could satisfy all of your security requirements. But, you know, sometimes people just want to do a first step is testing the public ones that everyone else sees. Then step two will be getting it on-premises and getting it all testing internally as well. Okay. And as far as like the <coughs> customer sizes, um, what can you tell me that information that what's the different type of like a size of the customer that you're going after? Sure, sure. I mean, we're going after everyone, but but we really spend the bulk of our time after companies that have a, a few hundred employees or they're just very well funded and successful startups because the, the platform is not. It's not open source. It's not free, and especially if you want to use the on-premises. So it's we definitely go after e-commerce companies and insurance companies and payment processors. But we have a lot of we have a lot of startups on the platform as well, especially for the SaaS model. If you just go to the website, you'll see that it's two hundred fifty dollars a month. You can actually log in, create your own account, and use the platform as you wish. And it's it's been really successful in that regard too, because people love being able to play with it themselves. And then later on, maybe they'll talk to us if they want to do a little more on-premises stuff. Right, right. And I, I see that uh, you went through 500 startups, right? Uh, no, we actually went through the ERA accelerator. Uh, 500 startups invested in us. They're one of our seed investors. Oh, okay. But you went to the ERA. So how was the accelerator experience for you? Would you recommend it? Yes, yes, definitely. It really really helps you for anything you're lacking. So ERA specifically, it's a lot, to, it's different from some others. They only take 10 to 12 companies and they're really focused on helping you day to day. Everyone's in the same room working together. The mentors are there, the investors come in. So if you're lacking experience in like in technology, they've got people that can help you. If you're lacking experience in marketing, they have people that can help you. Co-founder and I really sort of knew product and technology well. Our lack was in how do you communicate you know, selling and selling, basically selling both to customers and selling to the to investors to get some seed money so that you can really get things up and running. And so that's that's what they helped us with. And it was really it was really valuable. And currently I'm at the I'm in the Grand Central Tech Accelerator, which is a it's a little bit different. It's uh, ERA is really focused on young companies just trying to get a foothold. The Grand Central Tech Accelerator I'm in now is really focused on uh, more mature companies that are then that are just trying to build up a network and really work together it's it's sort of the same we're all working together there are mentors coming in investors come in but it's really about just you know there's 
things that I have questions about that everyone else has already answered. Like, what payment processor should I use? Should I use Square or Stripe? Well, you just ask that to the listserv for all the other companies here, and there will be four or five different responses from people that have been doing it for years. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I'm actually starting to do some interviews with uh, accelerators, different accelerators. So there's, you know, just like everything else, there's two sides to the picture. So I'm interested to also find find out from the uh, the founder side, uh, you know, how, how things work out. It's, I mean, I think sales, as everybody knows, is the holy grail. If you don't make sales, you're pretty much not going to be existent. And that's what I've also heard is that a lot of founders go in with the product, the product idea and the technology, and the accelerators can really help them with refining their sales process and really focusing on that. Exactly, because you find yourself just pitching every day, whether it's to an investor or a potential customer, or like at ERA, every Friday we actually had a pitching. Every company had to pitch in front of each other for like an hour straight, and it really helps you refine it and focus on it. And they bring in like, like guests to come in and say, like, I don't know what you're talking about. It's just about really honing what it is you do within a minute, because if you can't say it in a minute, it's going to be hard for you to to sell it, whether it's to a customer or an investor. Like, what what is it you do? And that's the that's the hard part. It's not about having a product that's limited. It's about picking the part of the product that is the most valuable you think to the customer and focusing in on that communication. And then from there you can expand upon it, but you really just got to hook them in and meet and immediately. It's like writing a, it's like writing a book. You really got to get them in that first paragraph. Right. Right. Great. So uh, final question, if I was a, a retailer or somebody thinking about either starting up a, a you know, an e-commerce website or changing my platform, what would be the, maybe the top, one or two questions you would recommend I ask of the platform providers that would, in, in your case, re relate to the maybe the API side of it? Sure, sure. So there's some platforms that allow you to have third-party APIs like a, that, a, that provide APIs. And you really want to ask that, especially if you have aspirations later on of building an app because it's, it's difficult to build an app if you don't have the APIs. Like you might be forced to use only their way of building an app or it might just be a, might just be like a web wrapper. So it's not a true native app, but it's just a website within an app. Like what you want to make sure is that this platform allows you to have the platform completely available through an API so that you can build an app from scratch and really build a beautiful native one. Because if it's just a wrapper, you're not giving much to your customer and you're not really getting the advantages of an app. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Patrick. It was a pleasure speaking with you, and I'm really excited to learn about API Fortress and what you guys are doing. I, definitely, all the best of luck uh, in getting, uh, you know, help to more people. We <laughs> oh, all need it. Yeah, I appreciate the time. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.